We are recording. Hello, Jessica. Good morning. Good Hi. afternoon. <laughs> yeah, that too. So um, I'm a bit old fashioned owing to my age and where I come from, ladies are first. So I would like to ask you the first question, if it's okay with you. Absolutely. What's with this sisterhood day? I've seen it all over your Instagram. So Monday, tomorrow is going to be International Women's Day. And right. International Women's Day is just a day to highlight, promote, and say thank you to all the women in our world. Mm -hmm. And I am just so tickled because being a survivor of family violence, being you know just um, a global traveler, I've had to reset my life multiple times. And so sisterhood has a very special place in my heart. And I am where I am right now because of my community. And so the women that I've chosen to highlight uh, have played some kind of very important role in my world and my recovery and my continued abilities to just add value and contribute into the world in purpose-driven ways. So mm -hmm. we decided- did, did, you feel, did you feel the support, um, feminine support, support coming from women? Support, mm -hmm. support, and advice and, and support coming from women is different in quality from or essence from support and advice and so on coming from men. Do, do you feel there's a feminine and masculine way of giving support? I think rather than simplifying male versus female, I think mm -hmm. it's about the quality. Mm -hmm. So I think that you can get support from a female, but if they're not balanced, it's not good support. And if you get support from a male, if it's not balanced, it's not support. So what I don't- is, What is balanced support? Can you tell me? I think emotional regulation and mental clarity. Oversimplification, mm -hmm. those are my two qualifications. So when I'm looking to build or to expand on my community, those are the only two things that I evaluate. What are you doing for your emotional wellness? How do you regulate in a moment of overwhelm? And then I ask a bunch of questions just to kind of surface level understand their, their way of thinking and their, their pathways. And then I'm able to either evaluate whether or not it's worth internalizing or to just say, oh, that's a very interesting thing. And then just leave it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I don't think that that's necessarily a female or a male right. thing. I think mm -hmm. that it's more about the quality and all of these, these women that I'm you know, specific for International Women's Day, it's one, because socially they call it Women's Day. Two, it's because for me and my evaluation system, for my qualifications, for my community, it's the emotional regulation and then it's also the mental tenacity. So every single woman has an absolutely magical mind and they have been able to navigate whether it's overcoming their own personal trauma because everybody has trauma of some sort, right? or it's a lot of just being able to understand multiple perspectives simultaneously, which I think sometimes is a quality that women or feminines, feminine energy is able to possess over masculine. Because if I turn it inwards, for me, I view masculine energy as execute, whereas feminine energy is kind of be. I don't have a lot of men in my world that just know how to sit, <laughs> which is why for me, it's, it's easy. You made a comment the other day about uh, sublimation. And so it's really good for me to cultivate that skill to convert things into socially acceptable ideas, concepts, and goals because my world is predominantly focused around you know, men. Now, nowadays, there's something called gender vertigo. Gender vertigo is owing to the rapid shift in gender roles, traditional gender roles. Men feel very threatened by the ascendance of what they consider to be female, asymmetric female power. Mm -hmm. They, and this is based in, in some part on facts because women, for example, are the majority of graduates of higher education. Women have attained dominant positions in a variety of professions, which used to be male enclaves. Um, and so, so there is there is an ascendance of women, possibly because women are better suited, better adapted mm -hmm. to the requirements of postmodern civilization. Postmodern civilization requires empathy, networking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So many men feel extremely threatened, mm -hmm. and men being men, boys being boys, they react with aggression mm -hmm. and and misogyny. 
Did, mm. did you feel or do you feel that there is a growing gap between men and women? I know I'm generalizing, but generally speaking, do you, do you feel there's a growing gap and in, in enmity even or hostility? It's interesting that you mentioned that because living in four different countries, I think that my perspective can be applied to my life in Hong Kong, my life in Singapore, my life in the US, or even my life in China. And I think to view that gap, it really is contextual. So in the US, I think, number one, we don't have mental clarity and we don't have a whole lot of emotional regulation. We have a society that's constantly keeping people in an emotional state, which, which prevents them from being rational on pretty much all aspects of life. So from that, I think, and also in context of you know women's empowerment and International Women's Day, I think International Women's Day plays into that male psyche of toxic masculinity. And if society is telling you that you're not good enough and that women can do everything, then, because who was it? Rosie Rivets was one of the first ones back in the day that I can do anything a man can do. And it was, you know, the, the, um, the traditional male roles. And so when we're kind of leaning towards that and a society is promoting that, I think that it does play on the individual's mind. And so from a guy's perspective, a, a male's perspective, if they are not necessarily able to articulate this because stoicism is also valued. So if they're not able to articulate what they're feeling, how are you able to navigate that in a healthy way? Mm -hmm. And, so and is, it different in, is it different in China? Because you've mentioned a variety of cultures. And so I personally believe yes, because I, I, think, mm -hmm. I think the element that's different is self-awareness. So Chinese, Chinese are more self-aware. Would you say it's a more self-aware society? I personally believe yes. I, yeah. I believe I believe Asians in general, specifically Chinese. I, I grew up in a Chinese and Italian household. So for the Chinese, it was reflect on your behavior, see on what it's going to look like from the outside. And when you have that almost paranoia or that level of awareness, it forces you to be more intentional on how you're responding or even reacting. And when you're in a Western culture, say like the Italian side, it's not as mindful. It's not as aware. It's just accept me as I am. So from a society perspective, you can oversimplify saying that it's more confident, but it depends on how you define confidence. It, defen it depends on how you define collateral damage. It depends on how you define whether or not it's a response or reaction, because there's nothing wrong with being able to express yourself. But for Italians, I mean, culturally we have, oh, you know, that's just the Italian passion. Is it really the Italian passion or is it just an unwillingness to regulate your emotions in a productive way? Mm -hmm. I, I lived in uh, South Korea and I worked in Hong Kong uh, for a while. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I had noticed for whatever it's worth, and by the way, I, I'm a Moroccan. So I have this, you know, I'm a Moroccan. I, I, I'm, I'm, I was born in Israel. So I'm a Jew, and I worked in Asia, I, worked, I lived in Africa for four years, so I, I was exposed, I, I've been lucky, I've been fortunate to be exposed to a variety of uh, cultures and, and societies. But having mentioned Asia, I think in the West, uh, these Westerns, not all Western societies, the West is not a monolithic construct, but you had mentioned the United States. So the United States where I also lived for two years, I lived in New York. So the United States um, is a borderline society. If I had to, to choose a, a diagnosis, it's a borderline society. There's mood, mood lability, emotional dysregulation, cognitive deficits, etc., etc., etc. It's absolutely a borderline society. And we know, we know today, recent studies of borderline personality disorder, we know that borderline is actually a series of self-states, discrete self-states. And these self-states come to the fore in order to cope with stressors, with stress, with anxiety, with impending doom, with abandonment, with humiliation, with rejection, with helplessness, yeah. and so on and so forth. So I think it's a borderline reaction, which essentially uh, defined. It's it's a reaction of defiance, acting out, decompensation. It's it's a very outward. It's what we call in psychology externalizing reaction. It's mm -hmm. a reaction of defined. Well, I think in 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 um, other cultures, and mm -hmm. I I put everything in a basket. There would be Asia. There would be Middle East. 
Arab countries, for example, have a lot in common with the Asian societies yeah. and so on. There, they take much more into account the collective gaze, the collective gaze and the other's gaze. Yeah. The other is in these societies incorporated as a determinant of identity. Mm -hmm. In other words, in the West, starting in the 17th century with Descartes, with René Descartes, the philosopher, mm -hmm. we broke the world in two. Mm -hmm. There was the observer and the observed. Mm -hmm. And every, everyone became an observer mm -hmm. and everyone was observed, had been observed or was observed. So, there were, so it broke the world in two. Mm -hmm. And this wreckage, this fault line, is limited to Western society. You don't find it in Asia. You don't find it in Africa. You don't... In Japan, the other is a crucial determinant of your identity. Yeah. He is not an. He is not an. He is not a strange. He's not the other person. Is never a strange. Never alien. Never outside you. There's not you and him or you and her. Yeah. It's everything one one enmeshed thing. Where yeah. when you think about your conduct when you make behavioral choices, yeah. you take into account not only your internal state, but everyone's internal state yeah, and connected. the collective state. Yeah. It's, it's much more, much more. And I, I, blame, I blame the enlightenment because it was the enlightenment that broke down the integral healthy connection between men and nature and men and men yeah. and atomized us atomizes, yeah. rendered us floating molecules with no mooring, no mooring and no adherence and no belonging. And it's horrible. I um, agree. I think, I think a lot of it is, is also not taking things into context. My senior thesis was on feng shui and it was disembedding. So how do you, if you just take feng shui, disembedding feng shui. So if you just take feng shui as a concept and you take it from the east and put it into the west what happens what's lost if you don't understand the cultural nuances mm -hmm. if you don't understand the historical attributes on on how it's actually part of a culture it's not just a concept but all the things that are connected with it and i guess you could also say it's bastardized so we've done the same thing with mindfulness we've done the same thing with meditation we've done the same thing with breathing we've done the same thing with so many different components i mean even the other day i was laughing I was trying this thing called the mirror, which was a, a workout thing. And they were having, um, I think it was Tai Chi, a Tai Chi um, module. And it was like a 10 minute or 15 minute session. And in my mind, I was thinking, okay, well, if this is such like a, a highly regarded thing, they should have one of the original teachers. My judgment dismissed it unfairly because it wasn't an Asian that was teaching it. Mm -hmm. Based on my experience, I was like, well, that's not even right. Mm -hmm. Techn from a technical perspective, it might be right. From a cultural lived perspective, it didn't feel right. And so for me, it was, it, I mean, that's my own judgments, right? And, and my own framing and, and everything. But to me, it's very interesting because it's not saying that people can't do it. It's not saying only certain people can teach it. It's just saying that there is more than just the academic aspect experience plays a huge role that I think is even a bigger discussion, which is my issue with a lot of therapists and doctors that if they haven't been through a process, how can they help others? How can you teach others? How can you get through it? I mean. <laughs> so you, you, you adhere to the view that um, personal requirement is a prerequisite for proper treatment. I mean, if you wanna treat victims of abuse, you it's it's much better if you had gone through abuse yourself if you had experienced abuse you you yes. believe this is this is I, I believe this is true specifically because when you're dealing with psychological warfare there's a lot of times that we like to try to make sense of it and once you've been through it you don't have to make sense of it you just have to accept it and so if you're coming from a clinical perspective then you try to put labels on it you try to do everything else or, let's be honest you're one of the top authorities in psychopathy and for narcissism. And there's a lot of people that don't understand it. They think that narcissism is just posting pictures of selfies and you know all this other stuff. It's dangerous. I mean, if, once you identify it, it's actually, it's predatory, it's malicious. It's, it might not be conscious, but that doesn't, 
that doesn't uh, excuse it. And so I think for a lot of a lot of clinicians, they aren't if they're not trauma informed, if they don't know how to identify it, then it could actually cause a, a lot of harm. I do you think empathy empathy is a prerequisite for treating people in, people that in the I healthcare serve. profession? I'm sorry. Do you think empathy is a prerequisite, a precondition for treating people in the helping profession professions? I think that I mean I think that there's good empathy and I think there's dark empathy. I think that if you're a very intelligent person or if you're a psychopath or a narcissist, I think that it's easy to manipulate systems. And I think that once you know it's a learned behavior. So once you know how to do that, because it's goal oriented to achieve what you want, I think that it's very easy to manipulate that. No, I but mean, I'm asking about therapists. Do you think therapists must have empathy? Or can you be a dis disempathic, impersonal therapist who is very good at what he does, but he doesn't have empathy? He's not I acting think, out of empathy. I think you have to have the awareness because again, I think that empathy is can be um, weaponized. So if you're an empathetic a therapist, if you don't have that awareness and that understanding for different cluster B personalities, from an experience perspective, you don't know how to identify if you're being manipulated. I that's just a very, have that's a very tall order. By this set of criteria, this would disqualify ninety nine percent of therapists. <laughs> I mean, I just order. had, I had a very. I don't want to devalue their experience or their intention. I think that there's a lot of value in it. What I would like to say is a couple of weeks ago, I was dealing with a very toxic individual that was trying to leverage therapy sessions in a harmful way to gaslight me. And if you oversimplify, why do you go to a therapist to understand yourself? Mm -hmm. The moment you are in a therapy session and you're spending more time evaluating another person than your actual client. Doesn't that challenge the entire system of why you're a therapist in the first place? Mm -hmm. Therapy is a tool, and like every tool, it can be abused, and, and so on. But it still leaves the question whether empathy and experience, personal experience, are prerequisites. Can we, for example, in the future, have artificial intelligence administering therapy? Um, I think there's been, there's been a program called Eliza, I think. Um, they did exactly this. Yeah. And, uh, and strangely, people were even more satisfied with the program than with uh, flesh and blood therapies. Yeah. Well, so. that's what I'm saying, because it's, like, it's difficult to manipulate an AI program, because with that connection, I mean, with a lot of cluster B personalities, they're predatory. So they understand that if there's somebody that's empathetic, they know how to tug on those heartstrings. And so when they tug on those heartstrings and it's a manufactured connection, if you're aware of it, you understand manufactured connection. If you're not aware of it, you, you don't understand the difference between manufactured versus authentic. And you, so portray, think, you portray therapy as a, as a potential minefield. 100%, 100%. I know many people. I mean, I, I worked in corporate and I know plenty of people that were going to therapy sessions under the premise of trying to understand themselves. But no, they, they were not going to therapy for that. And even admitted later, they were just looking for easier, faster, more efficient ways to accomplish their goals. And so it was a therapist and, and it's a, an internal joy to be able to, if you're so qualified, then if I was able to dupe you or if I was able to, to get something around, it's a, it's a personal satisfaction that I don't necessarily understand how to, how to quantify or hopefully I'm able to articulate it. But I see a lot of people that know how to work the system because it's not about, for some people, it's not about figuring out how to better themselves. It's being more efficient at being able to keep up their mask. Right, of course. The, the therapy is a set of skills, and game. you can abuse you can game. abuse these skills. <laughs> Everything's a game. <laughs> yeah. But um, do you believe in the very? Let's put it this way: What's the difference between a, a therapist and a very good and wise friend, or your grandmother, who mm -hmm. is a repository of intergenerational wisdom mm -hmm. and has seen it all, and you know, and has all the right answers? What's the difference between therapy and this? Therapy is structured, obviously, mm -hmm. but except the structure, does it offer any value added? Or should you just you know, stick to your good friends, good wise friends and good wise grandmothers? In theory, 
therapists are supposed to know a lot of information to be able to identify the different things. So in theory, you go to them with a, a therapist with a problem and based on their academics or based on a combination of academics and experience, they're supposed to be able to shorten that time frame of you to identify what's your, what you're going through and then how to understand yourself to fix it or to navigate it and help So they, they catalyze, they catalyze processes. 100%. They, ha they hasten them, accelerate them. In theory, in theory, yes. In theory, in theory yes. In theory. In, would, you go to a, would you go to a 29 year old therapist or to an 89 year old grandmother? 89 year old grandmother without hesitation any single time wouldn't you i'm sorry every time every 100%. single time you go 100%. to the grandmother so 100%. age has a lot to do with it and experience and exposure has a lot to do with it for me i think that when you look at experience and years and stuff like that for me specifically based on my experience i find it very difficult this might be my ego speaking but i find it very difficult to find a 29 year old that has been through similar experience so for the average person perhaps it's a different discussion for me personally I moved overseas at 22. I started my career in foreign countries. I've already, before I turned 30, I restarted my life four different times in four different countries and had my own business. That's not normal by society standards. So if I'm looking for therapy or if I'm looking for, and also experiencing family violence. So if I'm looking for help or support to navigate any of that, I think that I would rather go to somebody who's an 89 year old auntie or grandmother <laughs> or even a cab driver sometimes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I fully agree. I mean, Chance encounters, encounters in strangers, in, strangers in bars <laughs> can have enormous impact on you, you know? They don't have any connection. They don't have any, yeah. um, I mean, I also think that it's very parasitic because if you look at talking to a grandmother or an auntie, it's not an exchange of money. Whereas if you look at the system of therapy, it's not a definitive time of getting healed. So they actually benefit. I know a lot of people that are in therapy and they've been in therapy for 15 years and yet they're dealing with the same problem. There so is my a question perverse, is what are you learning in those 15 years? Yeah, there is a perverse incentive built into the structure of psychotherapy. A perverse yeah. incentive in the sense that the therapist has every incentive in the world mm -hmm. to perpetuate your victim, victim mentality and victim stance yeah. And then to drag you along for 15 years, the aforementioned 15 years. This is happening also online, where yeah. numerous numerous self-styled coaches and self-styled experts yeah. spew out an endless stream of you're a victim, you're a victim, you're a victim, you're a victim videos. And yeah. people get trapped in this bubble and they can't exit for the life of them. Yeah. There's been there's been a series of studies shocking studies in the past year alone yeah. and for example studies by gabay g-a-b-a-y mm -hmm. she she and others came up with a new construct in psychology it's called um the tendency for interpersonal victimhood the tiv construct yeah and they suggested that there are certain people who feel very comfortable and very good being victims they feel morally superior they feel legitimized mm -hmm. they feel in, a, in their comfort zone and so on. It's a bad trick for people. And, and, they, and other, some other studies, especially a few, a few days ago, a major study was published. They found that victimhood movements mm -hmm. um, are infiltrated, saturated, suffused with psychopaths and narcissists. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And these psychopaths and narcissists leverage these victimhood movements for Excellent. grandiosity, for, you know, power and, and so on and so forth. Victimhood is a very, very dangerous label. And one of the worst sins and crimes ever committed by the psychological community mm -hmm. is, is this, mm -hmm. that we had divided the world into angels and demons. Mm -hmm. We had created a morality play of evil versus good. Yeah. And we therefore, as psychologists, we had engaged in splitting. This is the splitting, primitive, infantile splitting defense mechanism yeah. where you're all good or you're all bad. Yeah. You're all evil or you're all good. You're all, yeah. you know. And so splitting, ironically, is the main defense mechanism of narcissism and, and, and borderlines, the main. Yeah. So the psychological community had, had acted narcissistically. 
Yeah. And all the coaches and all the experts, with or without quotation marks, mm -hmm. they have a perverse incentive to perpetuate your victim status. Mm -hmm. They don't have any incentive in the world. And we are like counting, we, 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 like, we regard therapists as though they were not human, yeah. as though these perverse incentives will never ever motivate them to act you know, improperly or immorally. Yeah. Why? They're yeah. human beings. The human beings, I mean, we can't put this burden on therapists. We yeah. can't demand from them to not be human. Mm -hmm. to, to, we can't ask, ask them to have a morality which is totally disinterested, mm -hmm. not self-centered. Mm -hmm. And this is a crime against therapists. The expectation that a therapist should behave in a way that no other human being can, disregarding their own best interest. And their own best interest is to keep in therapy. Yeah. Plain and simple. I think I think it's more about the, the broken system though, because I think that you can go more about that. I'm sorry. Could you it, it's about a broken system. Broken because system. You, can, you can go into something with the best intentions, and then after a while, the the cracks in the system end up giving you micro opportunities to stay in your lane and walk your truth, or you know, compromise your integrity and compromise your values and compromise everything because in order to make it, sometimes you gotta, you gotta, you know, be agile. And I know, I personally know a lot of therapists that started therapy for the right reasons. And then later on, they had to make so many micro compromises in order to stay in business or in order to, you know, continue doing what they thought that they wanted to, to do. I know a lot of people that, you know, they had practices as a therapist and then went into social work because they saw the fragmentation. I know a lot of people that are just livid at the fact you can go to a therapy session to get a label and you think that you're helping yourself because now that you've identified, a lot of it is being able to identify what, what's wrong and then find a solution or to, to get through it. At what point does the system allow that reevaluation? Because if everything is a process, why is it just one, you take a test and this is what you have for life. I think that in itself perpetuates the idea and the practice of a lot of therapists with, I was diagnosed with whatever personality nuance when I was four years old. And I'm still dealing with that when I'm 47 years old, as an example. Well, why, you're obviously a little bit different from four to 47, so why not? you know, have different tests in order 47? to- 47? You don't look a day over 20. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm 20. <laughs> I know, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm I know you're not 47. <laughs> I know you're not 47. I'm, th I'm 37. I was pulling your leg. To evaluate, but just to evaluate, like, such a big difference. So I was trying to, like, think of over a midlife crisis. I think midlife crisis in the U.S. context is 40, right? So I think that's when a lot of people, they have that awareness and the midlife crisis, people joke saying on how like, oh, you buy a car, you do whatever. To me, I think that is the threshold of when you get tired of playing by society rules. And that's when you start to play by your own rules. So is it really a midlife crisis or is it just 40 years is the benchmark where it's like enough is enough. Now I'm going to do something fun. But Society yeah, demonized you're quite that. right. You're quite right as far as scholar, scholarship goes. The midlife crisis has been debunked, debunked long ago. We we don't consider it as, as real. We are yeah. much closer to your view that people simply have changes in preferences and priorities. By the way, usually motivated by the death of the parents. Um, the death of parents is, is a very crucial uh, moment. But I want to I want to latch on to something you have said. I think. A major sin is reductionism. When we reduce people to their disorders, mm -hmm. we don't say this person has narcissistic personality disorder. We say this person is a narcissist. Mm -hmm. Similarly, we don't say this woman had been victimized. Mm -hmm. We say this woman is a victim. Mm -hmm. So we are, this is segdoc, that's taking a part and applying it to the whole. Mm -hmm. And so, Reductionism has done this to us because we, we have spent the last 60 years med medicalizing the human soul, mm -hmm. medicalizing psychology, mm -hmm. owing, to, owing to ulterior motives and hidden agendas of insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, hospitals, clinics, private practitioners. There was a lot of money in the system. Actually, mental health and health in general 
is the biggest economic sector in the world. The so there was a lot of money sloshing around mm -hmm. and dictating this attitude. Let us pigeonhole them. Let us pigeonhole. Let us use categories, not dimensions. Let us use lists, not, mm -hmm. not ranges. So you have the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is a list, a list of lists. Yeah. So primitive. Yeah. It's so bloody primitive. No yeah. etiology, no dynamics, That's no it. interrelatedness, no yeah. nothing. It's yeah. a list of lists like in the days of Carlos Linnaeus when he started with botany in the 18th century, when he was making lists of plants, you know, yeah. 18th century stuff. And, and this is the latest in, in the profession. Yeah. It's very lamentable, very Excellent. lamentable. Excellent. So as, as a, um, an authority in so many different aspects, you know, I have, I have great admiration for the work that you do and great admiration for you as an individual. And one of the things that I think is very sad in the whole context of mental health and psychopathy and you know therapy or, or any any of these larger larger pictures is the fact that there are a lot of people that don't agree. So if people that are talking about these topics, if they're not even on the same page, how can they fully expect to help and serve the people that they're trying to serve? Because I feel like there's a big disharmony. So like for me personally, I feel that a lot of the, the nuances, and I call them nuances, it could be fragments, breaks, whatever, of a personality is in my mind, an oversimplification of you do the best that you can given the tools that you have. So if you're in a situation and that situation is a trauma and it creates narcissism, as an example, I don't think that you're born with it. I think that it is something that develops because that is on how you needed to handle a specific, a very specific situation at a very specific moment. Just because you handled that very specific situation and that very specific moment at a certain age doesn't mean that that is your habit. It doesn't mean that that has to carry on through life. And, and I think that with narcissism or with the labels and people say they suffer from narcissism or they're narcissist, I think that that is very dangerous because I think that you know, once you have that label, then people will play into whatever you give them. And so if, if you're constantly condemning them, then they're always playing the defensive. If they're always playing the defensive, isn't that narcissism in general? Because you have to continue to defend yourself. You have to continue, you're, you're hurt. You don't need to be condemned. You need to be hugged. You need to be helped. And so I think if you kind of take a step back, I, I think this is one of my fundamental issues with the whole space of people that are trying to help you because just as you said before it's divide and conquer so if we have the the oppressors and the oppressed if we have the predators and the the prey if we have the manipulators and the empaths i i think that everything is a balance i think that every single person has both sides and they all have the capabilities to do different things but you know i i would love to you know hear your perspective on how if you have that fragmentation and if you know how to work the system, there's some people that want to try to change the system and there's other people that are just so accepting of the system. And they're like, how can I benefit from this? So if you take any of these personality tests, for example, how do you know? I mean, even if you, <clears throat> excuse me, even if you have an awareness, I would think that I would be able, if I had an agenda, I would be able to manipulate that test. Yeah. Well. So, so even That's from that, most, how do you... Most psychological tests are jokes because, for example, the main test uh, for narcissistic personality disorder, NPI, narcissistic personality inventory, mm -hmm. is a self-reporting test. We you were, like, yeah. awareness, how do you do that? <laughs> no, self-reporting. I mean, are you, are you haughty and arrogant? It's one of the questions. I'm kidding you not. Uh, what, the main test for psychopathy, which in itself is a very dubious category and probably culture bound in some way, but leave it, leave it aside for a minute. The main test is a PCLR mm -hmm. and the PCLR is a, a huge component of self-reporting and another component of input from the victims of the psychopath who are obviously in a position to criticize the psychopath, disagree with the psychopath. I mean, they are terrified and intimidated. And here's the test they, you ask the psychopath to be honest and then you ask people around him who are cowed and terrified to be honest as well. 
So the whole test is, but leave testing aside, I just gave a presentation in another international conference. We have met in an international conference for viewers. Yeah. So I just made, uh, gave a presentation in another international conference about the, the limitations of psychology, why psychology can never be a science. Mm -hmm. And there are two reasons why it can never be a science. One is the, the subject matter mm -hmm. is humans and human beings are mutable and changeable from minute to minute, from second to second. You are never, uh, uh, psychological experiments can never ever be replicated. End of story. Never mind how many times you try. So that's one problem. The second much bigger problem is that there is a huge debate about the language elements mm -hmm. and about literally everything fundamental. I, I, am a, I have degrees in physics and in medicine, other fields, even in philosophy. I have a PhD in philosophy. And in these fields, there is an agreement on fundamentals and there is an agreement on language mm -hmm. and there is a huge disagreement on how to combine language elements and fundamental elements mm -hmm. in psychology we don't have the foundation stone there is no agreement on language and there is no agreement on any fundamental That's nothing not a single thing is agreed and when i say agreed is not like shall we have coffee or shall we have tea but the disagreement is a gulf. It's unbridgeable. In each and, and in my presentation, I isolate 15 or 16 such disagreements. Very crucial, basic language elements and concepts where the disagreement is unbridgeable in principle. It's not a question of sitting together in a committee and reaching some uh, accommodation. In principle, you cannot reconcile and reach a compromise on any of these issues. And these issues are the core issues, the yeah. core issues. So psychology is a form of literature. Yeah. And if you want to consult the best psychologists in history, you would read Dostoevsky and you would read, you would read others. You would read, you would read authors yeah. because they have penetrated uh, human psychology much better than anyone else. Freud to a large extent was an author. He, he, mm -hmm. was, he was a good writer, he was a, you know, he had literary flourish yeah. and regrettably psychology had become grandiose mm -hmm. so it's a wannabe science mm -hmm. and so now psychologists are using statistics because it makes them feel like they are physicists you understand mm -hmm. and they are wearing white white coats because this looks like they are medical doctors it's pathetic yeah. it's absolutely pathetic yeah. psychology under these pretensions mm -hmm. is the epitome of pseudoscience yeah. not very different to astrology mm -hmm. in astrology we have a personality test it's known as the horoscope yeah. the zodiac is a personality test yeah. with 12 personalities yeah. so why don't we use astrology because it's a pseudoscience mm -hmm. and so when psychology pretends to be a science and with, the, with all the trappings of a science, you know, mathematics, and mm -hmm. this is beyond derisive. It's, 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 uh, it's horrible because it's, uh, psychology is deteriorating into, into pseudoscience. And people yeah. are feeling this. Yeah. There is total distrust in psychology. Yeah. People do not trust psychology. Mm -hmm. They do not trust science generally. They do mm -hmm. not trust expertise generally. Because there's this grandiose defense, I know as, as I, I, my truth is as good as your truth, my fact is as good as your fact, who are you, I have access to Wikipedia, so there's, there's a lot of, you know, anti-expertise. WebMD, anti WebMD is a lifesaver for a lot of people. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, but um, I think psychology is in a really, in a really, because people, for example, trust physics to a large extent, but they don't trust psychology at all, at all. Psychology is held in very low regard. Yeah. I think it's held in very low regard because it's trying to pretend that it's something that it is not. And people spot the fakery. You know. mm -hmm. But do, do you think that if you, can, if you connect it with medicine, modern medicine, that maybe that has something to play with it, play into it? Because if you go to a psychologist, as an example, or a therapist, something, and you get labeled and they give you a label and then they give you medicine 
that is supposed to help whatever ailment that they've identified you as. So now when you start putting chemicals and you start putting medicine inside your system, and it's under the assumption and the premise that this is what you're suffering from. If you, if you break your arm, you know what are the pain medicines in order to fix that broken arm. If you have to go under for a surgery, the doctors know what, what medicine to give for that. When it comes to the mind, it's, it's so cloudy because it's an invisible wound, right? There is no necessary, necessary um, test in my personal opinion, as you know, you've already mentioned the, the self self-diagnose or the, the um, I forget the word that you said, when, when you have to self-report. So when you're self-reporting all the different things, if you don't have the awareness and you're only sharing your perception and, and your own reality, if there's a flaw in that reality and what you're sharing to that professional person then results in number one, a flawed reality and a flawed sharing, number two, a flawed diagnosis, and then number three, a flawed treatment, then you're actually, whether it's intentional, unintentional, malicious, non-malicious, it doesn't matter. But once you start putting those medicines into your body, then it does have a chemical change to your system, which in my opinion can actually do more harm. So the intention might be to help, but then the actual execution could be um, not as useful. So what, what is your take on, on medicine in context of this is such a cloudy space? What happens to those individuals once they get that, that label and then those medicines that are supposed to help and then ends up causing more destruction? Um. We are very unfortunate that the seat of the, of the mind, whatever the mind is, we can't even agree on language elements because mm -hmm. I can have a, a huge argument about what is the mind, what is consciousness. We are not even close to an answer, but okay, for, for discussion's sake. We are very unfortunate that the seat of the mind is not in the pineal gland about which we know everything and which, which used to be considered as the seat of the mind. Mm -hmm. We are also very unfortunate that it's it's not uh, in the heart, at the heart, because we know everything about the heart. It's a very simple pump, and yeah. we know everything about the heart. Yeah. We are very unfortunate that the seat of mind, in all probability, is in the brain. Mm -hmm. And the reason we're unfortunate is that we know nothing about the brain. Nothing. I told you that I have education in medicine. I teach neuroscience. Right. So we know nothing about the brain. Mm -hmm. Nothing. We're in a state of utter ignorance. Mm -hmm. Neuroscience is a proto-science. Mm -hmm. It is at its very initial inception. Mm -hmm. Medicine has been practiced for well over 2,000 years. We have very good medical texts yeah. going back 2,000 years. Galenus, Galen. Yeah. We have good medical texts. Chinese mm -hmm. medical texts are wonderful. Mm -hmm. So medicine is very old science. Mm -hmm. Neuroscience is about 100 years old, and serious neuroscience mm -hmm. is about 20 years old. We know really? nothing. Yes, really. I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that. That's interesting. Yes, really, because, you know, real neuroscience started with imaging, with imaging and so on. So yeah. it's about yeah. 20, let's say 40, if I'm generous, years yeah. old, a few decades yeah. old. Yeah. We had discovered only recently that serotonin, mm -hmm. the neurotransmitter that regulates, allegedly regulates, may, mind you, uh, mood and mood disorders. Mm -hmm. We had discovered only very recently, and when I say very recently, I think it was about 10 or 15 years ago, mm -hmm. that serotonin is not manufactured in the brain. Mm -hmm. It's manufactured in the intestines. Mm -hmm. That's a recent discovery. Yeah. And yet we have been giving serotonin-based medication to people for well over 60 years wow. Wow. based on flawed knowledge and mm -hmm. on the assumption that it's manufactured in the brain. Yeah. We had discovered the greatest, biggest physical structure in the brain yeah. 12 years ago. Yeah. We, had, we did not know about this structure. Yeah. We had no idea that it exists. Mm -hmm. We had discovered it 12 years ago. We had discovered the system that flushes and cleanses the brain when you sleep mm -hmm. in conjunction with the spinal cord mm -hmm. 10 years ago. Yeah. That, is the system, that is the system that is responsible for dreaming, mm -hmm. apropos Sigmund Freud. Yeah. We know nothing. We are children in the woods. Yeah. We know absolutely nothing. Yeah. And yet, 
we're infested and infected with grandiosity in all these professions. Yeah. So neuroscientists pretend that they know everything about the brain and they feel confident and comfortable to intervene in the brain. Yeah. May I remind you of lobotomy? Yeah. They feel comfortable to interfere and intervene in the brain, which is an act. I don't have words. I'm speechless, which is a unique state for me. Yeah. It's, it defies belief. It's a psychopathic act. Yeah. It's absolute psychopathy. Yeah. To pretend that you know when you know that you don't know. And then to go into another person's live brain yeah. and intervene in it and interfere in it and obstruct it and change it and cut it and flood it with chemicals. And when you don't know, you do not know what the outcome will be. End of story. It's ethical, That's ethical, utterly ethical. psychopathic. Yeah. Utterly it's, psychopathic. It's very, it's very interesting because being an athlete, so um, having athletics be such a strong foundation as, as part of me, I, I was a sprinter, so I, I did the 400. And that makes thinking, one of us. <laughs> <laughs> but thinking, you know, as I'm like re reflecting on all of that, it, it's so true because I think that, you know, we grew up, or at least my family, we, we grew up with, with the thought that endorphins make you happy and happy people are value add, right? And so if you're working out, working out equals, you know, happiness, like the, the happy chemical. And when I think about it, it, it's not necessarily something that the brain is, is creating or even, you know, gut health is a big buzzword for the past couple of years. It's, it's growing in popularity. It's just wait a couple of years and it'll change to something else. I think everything is based in breath because there's a lot of times that if we're, you know, having a panic attack, or having anxiety, if we're having um, depression, if we're having any of these, these swings, a lot of it, if you notice your breath, your breath ends up getting really shallow and you kind of get a little bit disconnected. And so just by doing a workout, whether it's a sprint, a high intensity interval workout, which is what I teach and what I coach, um, you get that breath back in. So you don't even have to talk about what's happening in the mind. You don't have to talk about what's happening in the belly. You just know that once you're getting that, that oxygen into your system, that something is happening. It doesn't matter what, but it's just, it's, it's helping you do a reset. And I think that is probably one of the most powerful things that a lot of people are, are getting shadow banned or a lot of people are, are being muted. A lot of voices are being muted because the breath is something that is an, an an unconscious act is something that just happens and the body just takes care of you by by being able to do it there's no medicine the breathing is the medicine and so by doing that you can't monetize it and so i think going into the conspiracy side of things if we have the breath as being the most powerful tool to get back to and the most powerful medicine to do and now we're dealing with a global pandemic that is attacking our respiratory system and i I'm not saying it's a conspiracy. I'm just saying it's critical thinking. <laughs> think about the ramifications. Think about how to protect yourself. Think about how to empower yourself, how to be like a patient advocate and a self-advocate and, uh, you know, self-master and, and all the different things that are associated with I it. Want, I, I, it's very interesting when you kind I of I want to generalize from that. I'm sorry? I want, to, I want to generalize from that, to take what you have said and generalize it. Yeah, and sorry, I'm just um, thinking out loud because as, you, as you're saying no, that, I'm just like, oh my goodness, like the pieces are starting to come together again. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I love this, this way of talking. Um, fireside, fireside chat, not, uh, you know, not a structured interview or dialogue. Yeah. Um, w when psychology started, mm -hmm. the focus was on the mind for some extremely strange reason. I mean, no one pays attention. No one has ever asked why. Why did the first psychologists focus on the mind? Mm -hmm. Why, for example, didn't they take into the equation the body? Mm -hmm. There was a divorce between mind and body. Mm -hmm. And like the body didn't exist. Mm -hmm. You actually would be hard pressed to find the word body mm -hmm. in the entire 34 volumes of collected writings of Sigmund Freud. Not I remember three times, I may be wrong, but I think about three times. Mm -hmm. So th there's no body. Mm -hmm. Even when there was experimental psychology, experimental psychology started in the end of the 19th century in Germany, a guy called Wendt, mm -hmm. and later on James in the United States and so on. Mm -hmm. Even then, it wasn't body oriented. They were experimenting with memory, with, you know, but it wasn't, there was no body there. Mm -hmm. No one asked, for example, subjects 
to hold their breath, see what happens after that. Mm -hmm. Or to move their eyes, like today we do in EM EMDR, you know? Yeah. Or to, yeah. No one asks people to play with their bodies and see what are the psychological implications, mm -hmm. which is shocking yeah. because it was a departure, departure from all previous experience of humanity. The Romans said, healthy mind in healthy body. Mm -hmm. The perception that the body was a main engine and driver of psychology and more specifically mental health was embedded in all previous cultures, civilization and societies, the Jews as well, I mean, you name it. Yeah. And yet when psychology had started as a science, so to speak, they divorced the body and the mind and they dumped the body in the trash can. Yeah. And so now we are, we are trying to reverse this. We have body-based trauma therapies. Yeah. as you well know we have so we are re trying belatedly and haltingly and hesitatingly introduce elements of the body organs parts mm -hmm. into into the treatment but we still don't have a single holistic mm -hmm. uh, psychotherapy or school of psychology yeah. which incorporates both mind and body as an integral whole we don't have this Absolutely. our mind is broken that's the yes. first comment i wanted to make the second comment i wanted to make there is enormous confusion because psychologists are not trained in philosophy. Mm -hmm. So they don't know to spot logical fallacies. Mm -hmm. They don't know the difference between correlation and causation. Mm -hmm. Causation. This goes for neuroscience. Consider, for example, in neuroscience, when they tell you the reason that you're behaving in a certain way is because this and this group of cells is acting out, is fulfilled with blood and has electrical activity. How do we know that it's not the other way around? Okay. That your behavior had created this activity in the brain, not that the activity of the, in the brain had created the, the behavior. And how do we know that there is no third element mm -hmm. which had created both your behavior and the activity in the brain? Absolutely. It's very primitive thinking. It's linear, it's unidirectional, it's A causes B, this went out of fashion in physics during the times of Aristoteles uh, yeah. 2,500 years ago. Mm -hmm. Psychology is 2,500 years ago after most sciences, not in its discoveries, but it's in, in its philosophical grounding. It's very primitive, very Absolutely. primitive thinking. Yeah. Drives me insane because I'm trained in other disciplines. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, think it's, I think it's also very interesting too because depending on the framing, right? So if, if you look at self-sabotage has been a very big topic for a lot of my, my circles and coming from a trauma space and a recovery space, is it really self-sabotage or is it playing out cycles and situations to help you feel comfortable? Is it an addiction? Because to me, if you're self-sabotaging by society standards, then you're not playing as big as how you can. You're, you're not, you're, you're doing something, you, you take that step forward and then you take two steps back. You take that step forward and you take two steps back and you're constantly pulling yourself out. But even if you're not doing it intentionally, because if there's trauma that either has been identified or not identified, what you're doing is you're in a merry-go-round of a cycle that's keeping you comfortable. And that plays into what we talked about before is that victim mindset. So even when you try to get out of that victim mindset by society conditioning, or by personal experience, it's reinforced by society conditioning. It becomes very difficult to make that shift, which in the conference that we were speaking at together, I mentioned the nuance between having that victim mindset and then the survivor mindset and then the warrior mindset. I think it's incredibly important to have that. And that's that's why I will never go back to school to, to become a therapist um, because I think fundamentally that is something that is missing um, in terms of the process. And so as a coach, easier to, to value me as a, a performance coach. It's, this is what you were doing. This served you for that. Does it still serve you? No, and get rid of it. Find something else. <laughs> and then, does it serve you? Cool, use it while you can. No longer serves you, get rid of it. Let's develop something else. And it, it's a very simplistic approach to constantly have that critical thought to evaluate, is this serving me in this moment? As soon as it stops serving me, why am I holding on to it? 
And then if you're holding on to it, is it because of trauma? Is it because it's keeping you comfortable? Okay, cool. If that's keeping you comfortable, let's find something else to, to get you comfortable. Or let's just get comfortable being uncomfortable. I mean, for me, related to this conversation, I'm just, I'm so tickled to share this space. I was so nervous. <laughs> and it was just lean in, lean in, just have faith and just lean in. And you don't have to spend so much time in, in your head. You just spend time in your heart and then you just appreciate the you moment. You don't need to be nervous. I'm a pussy kid. No. <laughs> but you're you're one of the most intelligent people. You're highly regarded. I'm an intelligent you, pussycat. You're right. <laughs> you, you're just um, very, very human. At the same time, you're very uh, educated and you're also very experienced. And I think that combination based on what i've already I'm shared slightly, is i'm slightly older than you it's it's, okay. well, it's also just it's, age nothing else trust me <laughs> but it's also but it's not normal to have like people that have that self-actualization and that that kind of self-awareness but then go to the different lengths to try to understand themselves and then work through it so i mean even on your social media pages it's you're constantly sharing kind of like personal antidotes and then also how it applies to science or how it applies to psych psychopathy. And I think there's a lot of people that don't do that because there's that Chinese wall where you have to pretend like you're perfect and you can't share, the, there's that wall that you can't, it's, it's almost like a violation if you share too much of yourself. You're making, so I, I you're, think you're making there's a lot of power in that. You're making wonderful points. You know, when psychology <laughs> started, not really. I don't give compliments by the way. As I, I stick to facts. So when psychology had started, the main source was introspection mm -hmm. and anecdotes, case studies. They were called case studies. Yeah. Freud and Jung had built the entire edifice, which is a magnificent edifice, which is now, by the way, fully confirmed by neuroscience. There's been an article recently. I don't remember where, but a scientific article. Almost all, everything they said, especially Freud, is fully substantiated by neuroscience nowadays. But leave that aside, the whole edifice was constructed on introspection on the one hand and case studies, which are essentially anecdotes. They didn't study cohorts or populations of 20,000 people, 60,000 people, mm -hmm. and so on. And then behaviorism came in, science came in, a pretensions to science, wannabe science, mathematics, lab codes, we are doctors, we are physicists, we are, and they discarded all this. They threw all this wonderful accomplishment of the human mind. They trashed it. In the majority of universities in the West, it's forbidden to teach psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic theories, and lately, object relations theories as well. Shocking. It's by far the greatest achievements of psychology. And trust me, what I don't know in psychology is not worth knowing. It's by far the greatest accomplishment. So this is comment number one. Comment number two, what we consider, the problem is that we again, again, break everything apart. There's mental illness and there's mental health. It's like there's no spectrum. Either you're this or you're that. It's again splitting. It's, and it's wrong. It's not true. Mm -hmm. To start with, all mental illness, started off as a positive adaptation. Mm -hmm. People had to survive. Children had to survive somehow. So they evolved what we call mental illness, mm -hmm. but it allowed them to survive. Mm -hmm. It allowed them to thrive. It allowed them to become the adults that they are today. It had been positive at some time. Yeah. At some point, what we call mental illness was actually a sign of healthy self-defense. Absolutely. That's, and on the other hand, what we call mental health is not always mentally healthy. For example, if you were an inmate in Auschwitz, would it have been mentally healthy not to have depression? Mm -hmm. Of course not. Mm -hmm. Depression is a healthy reaction. Right. It all depends on context. Mm -hmm. it's Normal a, human response on abnormal human behavior. So yeah, so what we call, I mean, this definitive, decisive divisions, are, they're nonsensical. I, Everything is context dependent, even I would say culture dependent too, and dependent on time in history, fashions, fads, influences. I mean, it's all, it's all one, big, one big thing. And I give one example with this, I will allow you to speak again. 
I monopolize the conversation too much, but I'll give you one example, addiction. Mm -hmm. Well over 40% of the structures and surface of the brain, 40, that's four zero, are dedicated to addiction. Mm -hmm. The brain is a machine that generates, fosters, sustains addiction. It's an addiction machine. Yeah. End of story. Yeah. There's nothing else that comes close. Language consumes 3% of the brain, language. Um, interpersonal, I mean, behavior consumes 7 to 8%, depending how you define it. Emotions consume less than 1%. Yeah. Amygdala, amygdala, and so on. Memory consumes something like 6%. Yeah. Addictions consume 40% of the brain. Yeah. Should we then not say that addiction is actually the normal state? that evolution had conditioned us to be addicted, had created our brain, gave us an instrument that whose main role and function is to have us addicted. Yeah. Isn't addiction the core of love and family formation, for example? Yeah. For example, yeah. isn't yeah. addiction what drives us to mm -hmm. great accomplishments, to learning, to, mm -hmm. I mean, Addiction probably is by far the most important element in human psychic life, way outweighing emotions and cognition. Yeah. And yet, when we say addiction, what do we think about? Illness, dysfunction, bad, to be eradicated, to be destroyed, to be... So it's this morality play, this reductionism, this polarity. You know, it, it, people talk about bipartisanship, um, partisanship in, in Washington. <laughs> that's, that's an expression of our world. We are tribal. We're tribal. We're tribal. We're isolated. We are aggressive. We're defiant. We, we break apart. We're atomized. We're broken. Yeah. We're broken. Everything is broken, not only psychology. Mm -hmm. Everything, politics, society, and it penetrates the mind. It's a, our mind is broken. The yeah. bi bicameral mind is broken. I agree. I agree. I, I think you touched on a lot of different points. I think in context of addiction in the US, addiction is oversimplified to drug usage. So you have, you know, alcoholics, people are addicted to alcohol. You have, you know, the drugs the, we have the opiate crisis, which is like the biggest crisis that we're dealing with right now. And it's very interesting to me that if addiction takes up about 40% of you know the person's mind and emotions are only 1%. If you take a step back and understand that, I mean, you obviously already understand this, but for the sake of everyone that's listening, if they oversimplify and understand that addiction is a way to survive in a moment and it's a, it's a way to cope with a certain situation. If we were able to increase that 1% of emotions to actually have civil discourse or actually have meaningful connections or communication about anything to articulate, feel, or even exist in some of those heavy, socially unacceptable emotions, then maybe that would have a little bit more of a balancing act between those addictions or in my personal opinion, which is a coping mechanism. I don't believe in addiction. I believe that everything is a coping mechanism. So how do you, with that awareness, how do you shift from a coping mechanism into a tool? Same thing with what I was talking about before. This worked for you when it needed to work, but does it still work? If no, let's switch it. <laughs> and yeah. I think that's that's an oversimplification because for me, like I could very easily, you know, say that I've had plenty of addictions. I mean, I have a very addictive personality. I'm a high achiever. So, I mean, <laughs> maybe not an uh, Olympian athlete. You don't look a day over 20. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but I mean, for me, it's like I have that grit and I have that resilience and I have that mind where once I set my intention to, to accomplish something, I don't waver. So it's the biggest compliment from anybody that I worked with or any of like my bosses or, or superiors was just, when you say you're going to do it, it's going to get done. And so for me, that's an addictive personality. That is a staying focused at all costs. That is a, I said I was gonna do it and my integrity is gonna mean something. You're only as good as your name. And so from that, how is that not also an addiction? I mean, that's, it's a very pointed- It is addiction, what it, it is, absolutely 100%, addiction. <laughs> 100%, I mean, if you look at a, a, a drug addict as an example, they're going to do whatever it takes in order to get that hit. So if you apply the same addiction to people that are goal-oriented, it's the same thing. 
I mean, we're staying very pointed until we cross that finish line. Same thing, finish line on this side, finish line on that side. Why is it that people don't talk about addiction or addictive personalities or coping mechanisms um, you know, within the high achiever space? Because we're perfect. We're, we're probably more dysfunctional than a majority of people. We just have it too, too much of an ego to, to allow everyone to, to, to help us. And so I, I think that that in itself is a dialogue that prevents people, and again, divide and conquer, right? So we, we think that as achievers or as goal-oriented people that we're superior, that we're better than everyone else. No, we're just as dysfunctional, we're just as broken. <laughs> we just use different things in order to, to get us through. And, and that's one of the big things that I like to talk about is similar to yourself, I, I share personal antidotes and I, and I get criticized for it all the time. Just how are you actually good at what you do if you're constantly talking about problems that you're going through? It's because I'm sharing on how to move through it. I mean, life is about imperfection. Life is about how you respond. It's 10% what happens to you and then 90% how you respond to it. So if I'm sharing on how you respond, I'm sharing the questionable decision that I made <laughs> and then how I'm able to kind of recover through it. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that being, you know, somebody who has created life in four different countries, somebody who has climbed corporate ladders, somebody who has crossed Ironman finish lines, if you want a quantitative thing in 12 hours, these are all things that are easy to verify. And what is to say that in the behind the scenes, I was also dealing with trauma. So for me, that was my catalyst to become the perfectionist or to become the achiever. You could very easily go to, I know plenty of women that have the daddy issues. Oh man, I used to get so angry when people were just like, Jesse, you have so many daddy issues. And in my head, I was like, well, I never turned to drugs. I never turned to prostitution. So I don't have daddy issues. You're crazy. I'm not accepting that label. But then when you start doing your own work and you start thinking about it, it's like, well, what's the difference between a sex addiction or a drug addiction or something that society isn't viewing as healthy versus the achieving which society is valuing as healthy. And, yeah. and I'm not making a judgment to anyone else. I'm talking specifically about myself, but that's what I like to promote on all of my social media and on my pages is to normalize this duality and to normalize the fact that like, <laughs> let's evaluate on a consistent basis what we're doing here. <laughs> again, uh, again, we are faced with essentially the same problems the for example we we say emotions cognitions addictions mm -hmm. these are artificial mm -hmm. separations they are caused by language language here is an an obstruction not of help as any zen buddhist would tell you so um, emotions for example today we know are intimately connected to cognitions yeah uh, even there are schools in psychology which have reconceived of emotions as a subtype of cognitions, as yeah. thoughts, some type of thoughts. So should we maintain this distinction going forward? I, I don't think so. What about uh, addiction? Is addiction only about the thing you're addicted to? Of course not. Mm -hmm. Addiction is a total solution. Mm -hmm. Because when you're an addict, it structures your life. It provides you with a social set. So drug addicts, they socialize with other drug addicts. So it fulfills a social function. Mm -hmm. Drug addicts have to obtain money to pay for their habit. Mm -hmm. It structures the work habits or the thieving mm -hmm. habits. <laughs> yeah. it, um, drugs are consumed at regular intervals, usually most difficult drugs, most class A drugs are consumed at regular intervals. Mm -hmm. So they structure the day. Mm -hmm. drug, ad, drug addiction has very little to do with the drug, which is why it's extremely difficult to rehabilitate drug addicts and alcoholics. Well over 80% of alcoholics, 80, mm -hmm. relapse within the first year of rehab. Yeah. Because, because it has nothing to do or little to do with the alcohol or the drug. The okay. alcohol and the drug is an ecosystem or what I like to call ego system. Yeah. It's an ecosystem which provides a total solution. Yeah. It provides meaning, it provides direction, provides purpose, provides mm -hmm. social, social uh, set or social context, milieu. It provides uh, th something to do. It provides, you know, it's everything. It's a total solution. Yeah. And in this sense, is this very, very different, for, ex for example, to religion? 
I'm not quite sure. It's also a total solution. People go to church to pray, no way. They go to church to socialize, to see and be seen, to laugh, to talk, to sing together, to feel good. To... There are so many functions to religion, which have nothing to do with God or any of his uh, angels. Mm -hmm. So all this artificial, all this reductionism, the, the, ah, the addiction, that's the drug. We take care of the drug, we take care of the addiction. Ah, emotions, they have nothing to do with thinking. It's all this breaking down. Mm -hmm. when, when humans are an integrated unit and a contextual, so I'm against the concept of individual, individual, yeah. divided from the world. I'm yeah. against the concept of personality. Mm -hmm. I think humans are entities that are integrated in huge networks of, of similar entities. Mm -hmm. Their identity is like a Venn diagram. You know these circles? Yeah. Their identity is where the two circles overlap, this small area where they overlap, this oval in the middle. This, it's a Venn diagram. Mm -hmm. And to look just at the oval, you know, cross-eyed, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that's extremely misleading because you're ignoring the seriously big circles that had created this. Context. Thing. Everything's context. Context. Everything. Relational. Yeah. So today we have a relational approach to personality theory. We are beginning to understand that, for example, the, the what Freud called the ego would have ne would never, it never develops unless there is object relations, relations with other people. Yeah. We're beginning to realize that people, what we call individuals, yeah. are the outcome of complex interpersonal and social processes. Yeah. Yeah, I, so I, think that, yeah. I think that that brings it, you know, 100% full circle too, because one of the, I mean, there's many things that I, I honor and, and value for the gifts that you bring into the world. And the number one thing that we connected over uh, with the conference a couple of weeks back was talking about narcissistic beliefs. So I think that in itself is a very powerful nuance because I was very narcissistic and I had narcissistic fleas because that was my survival technique. I was surrounded by a whole lot of people that were causing me harm in a very malicious and intentional way. And for me to not have that fragmentation or for me to protect myself, I had to almost be one step ahead. So I have to, if you want to beat them, you got to think like them. And so for me, it was like, all right, cool, game on. This is, if this is what we're doing, then I'm going to stay a step ahead of you. I'm going to think like however you're thinking in order to protect myself. But is that who I am? No. That was who I needed to be in that moment in order to protect myself. So again, is it a coping mechanism or is it a tool? It's something that served me for a very specific moment of life. And then I had to evaluate, does it still serve me? And I didn't like it how I felt when I was behaving in that way because it, it, it was closed, it was tight. It was from a body perspective, it was just, I wasn't sleeping and I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> Oh, we right, exactly. I got exactly. the lines up here, so I don't look 25, and I, rather than the happy lines over here. <laughs> and so for me, it was like, I think that was one of the most powerful things. And, and you know, I, I have a lot of admiration for the work that you do and, and the message that you share and the communities that you are, are building and continuing to foster and a, a, a body of analytical people and thinkers, critical thinkers, and, you know, understanding how to apply different things and, and just understand it at a, a deeper level, which I think a lot of people, they, you know, get into. I laugh because one of your videos at the very end, it was saying, this is not a support community. This is an educational type thing. And I had laughed because I caught myself because one of the ways that I relate to people is by sharing personal stories. I'm like, you know what, Dr. Sam's right. I was like, I'm not going to share the story. <laughs> Keep it to questions because that in itself flips a switch from being in that victim mindset of, you know, um, staying in that reoccurring system. Hamster wheel. And, oh. and yeah, the hamster wheel. And then it, it, it breaks that, even if it's just a momentary, you know, reminder, it breaks that, that habit and that cycle. And then it gets you into the inquisitive side, which I think is the difference between if you're in the hamster cycle, then you're in that victim mindset. Once you start asking questions, you're in that survivor mindset. And so 
I mean, I, I have a lot of admiration for everything that you do. And so for me, I think that is even at the very subtle, subtle perspective of language and setting standards and boundaries and telling people what you need to expect. I don't think that that is obtuse. I don't think that's grandiose. I don't think that that is narcissistic. I think that that is part of healthy, normal behavior in order to facilitate forward movement. And unfortunately, society has branded that otherwise. And so I think that in context of some of the messages that you share is, are you narcissistic or do you have the fleas? I don't think that I'm narcissistic, but I definitely know there's plenty of times I have fleas because yeah. when, I'm, when I'm in my environment contextually, if I'm in my environment, it's all abundance. No if I'm not in my environment, if I'm pulled into somebody else's environment, I got to protect myself. And I, I hate even acknowledging that. Um, I, I don't know if you're a parent or not. I, it's not, I, I wouldn't like to pry, but, um, single, <laughs> no, okay. no, no children, yes. uh, intelligent, <laughs> intelligent, single, um, <laughs> but would you care to talk a bit about appropriate or right parenting? If you have any thoughts about this, mm -hmm. uh, what would constitute right parenting? So even though I'm not a parent, I think one of the hangups for me is I view parenting as a minimum 18 year commitment to another individual. I don't see it as a commitment to a child. I see it as a commitment to somebody that you're procreating with. So for me, it's, I think that parenting isn't a single individual thing. I think it's a team effort. So I think that the most important relationships for a child are learned from the parents. So if you, are selecting a partner that you can simultaneously be and grow and be and grow and be and grow. I think that's a healthy dynamic. And I think that is very important as a parent to, to have that duality and that space to kind of be and grow and be imperfect, but then also strive for excellence. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily have that because they don't have that, that personal strength or that personal cord or even that personal awareness to know that they're a complete individual. So they're always looking for their better half. I hate it when society is talking about find your better half. You're not complete until you find another person. That's not true. You are complete. And as soon as you make the decision that you are complete and that you want to be complete, then it changes the entire game where you can find another complete human being. And when you have two complete human beings, imperfect, but complete, right? Then you are able to facilitate an environment that is going to more or less be healthy for child rearing. So it's easy for me to say this in theory because I'm not a parent. Um, one of my hangups is my 18 year commitment to another individual. And because of my family violence, I'm still working through what mm -hmm. it means and what, what I think is healthy. And so I, I think it's a, it's a little bit of a transition. So I, I might not know what it is, but I definitely know what it's not. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say something a bit controversial about parenting. I think the two main roles of the parent mm -hmm. um, is to push the child away mm -hmm. and to traumatize the child. Mm -hmm. I'll try to explain. <laughs> Sounds bad. You learn more through adversity. So uh, at a surface level, I, I understand that. And I, I don't have a, a you know, pushback for that. I quiz it, yeah. please. <laughs> when I say to push the child away, I'm of course referring to the very crucial phase of separation individuation. Mm -hmm. At some point, the child needs to separate from the parent and create his or her own boundaries. Mm -hmm. And then within the boundaries become, I don't like the word individual, but become himself or herself mm -hmm. so i prefer jung's term constellated self constellated because it takes from everywhere and everything and so on. so it becomes a self but to become a self you need to give up you need to give up on your parents mm -hmm. it is a, a giant trauma possibly the greatest trauma in life to give up on the gods to give up on these infallible omnipotent, omniscient, perfect uh, entities that guarantee your survival. These entities guarantee your survival. To venture out into the world grandiosely, as you need grandiosity, that's why all children at age two have primary narcissism, healthy narcissism, because you need to be grandiose. 
to say goodbye to mommy and take on the world when you're two years old. Right. Never mind how precocious you are, you still need grandiosity. So this, and, and a good parent allows you, not only allows you to separate, if you don't separate, pushes you away, not in a bad way, mm -hmm. encourages your autonomy and independence and personal agency by distancing herself, never mind how much you protest and how much you traumatize and how much you cry and how much you beg, she needs to push you away. I'm saying mother, but it applies to father as well. Mm -hmm. The second thing that a good parent, so first thing is to push away. Mm -hmm. The second thing that a good parent must do is to traumatize the child. Mm -hmm. Every time you set a boundary, every time you discipline, mm -hmm. every time you say no, every time, each and every one of these times is a mini trauma. Mm -hmm. It's the child at age one or two or even up to age four finds it extremely difficult to tell the difference between external and internal. He's developing this skill gradually up to age four. Age four, it's already okay, but up to age four. Mm -hmm. So whenever mommy says no, or sets a boundary, or goes away because she has to, mm -hmm. or doesn't attend to your uh, temper tantrums, and every time she does this, it's a mini trauma because it is perceived as something coming from both outside and inside. Yeah. It's an internal process as well. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's traumatizing. Yeah. But of course, a good parent has to traumatize the child yeah. and yeah. has to push the child away for yes. the child to become healthy. It is yeah. the bad parents, what mm -hmm. Andre Green called dead mothers. The bad parents or what Winnicott, Winnicott said there's a good enough mother. Mm -hmm. So they're not good enough mothers, the bad mothers. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who refuse to let the child separate yeah. because they are selfish or narcissistic or insecure yeah. or they're borderline or they are disturbed in some way. Or, and, and so they won't let the child separate. Mm -hmm. and, they, and even worse parents never traumatize the child. They spoil the child, put, it, put the child on a pedestal, idolize the child thereby preventing personal growth. This personal growth is only by friction with frustrating and bruising reality, only. Yeah. And if you isolate the child from reality, mm -hmm. you are doing a disservice. And so these people instrumentalize the child. Yeah. He becomes the tool for realizing their dreams and aspirations, yeah. or they parentify the child. Mm -hmm. They force the child to become a parent. Yeah. These are all forms of bad parenting. Mm -hmm. And it, it is counterintuitive, but the good parent pushes the child away and traumatizes the child on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. That's the good parent. The bad parent never does this. Right, right. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that, you know, adding on to that, the concept of roots and wings. So the, the concept of wings, have you, have you heard of this before, roots and wings? So my understanding of, of roots and wings are for wings, you're giving that autonomy and you're giving that independence and you're giving all those tools. And, and for that, my family did a very good job with their parenting uh, towards me with giving me that independence and that those capabilities to, to do you know, everything that I am supposed to do or can do so that I'm, I'm not dependent on others. The missing component was the roots. So having the place where when things get overwhelming, that I can turn to them. Because the dynamic with my family was, they give me the tools so that I could be independent and that I could do whatever I need to do. But then if and when there was a time where I was unable to do something, that was not a safe place for me to take refuge. Because if I took refuge, it ended up just being a lot worse. So you learn, all right, if I'm already going through it, and I can't go here for support because if I go here for support, it's gonna be worse. Then that's a learned behavior to, to, to go elsewhere. And I think that is the balancing act because I think my parents created enough trauma for me to learn those skills because I, I think society context trauma is gonna be bad. So, you know, I've, I've talked in great lengths that I didn't think that my parents were abusive. I just think that when it came to their own personal journey, they weren't able to handle their own trauma or their own things in a productive way. And yeah. it resulted in harm towards me. So 
they're imperfect. I love them dearly, but that is what created that, that disharmony. And so I think that going back to the 18 year commitment on how I view parenting is being able to regulate yourself, being emotionally regulate yourself, being able to have that mental tenacity and being able to appreciate, understand, be graceful with yourself that you are an, a flawed human being whilst also trying the best that you can. So I think having a partner that can help check you in those components is the number one vital thing. So there's gonna be plenty of times where I might be promoting wings and I might forget about the roots. So my partner in life should be the person that's going to say, Jess, time out. Let's make sure that we're giving them the tools to you know, be independent, but also we want them to turn to us if they need to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and so I, I think that that's an important nuance that I think a lot of people, they don't, they don't have that balance. So it's a lot of people, in my personal opinion, it's too much roots. <laughs> so yeah. it's uh, the clinical term, the clinical term for roots, the clinical term for roots is safe base. That's a clinical yeah. term. Yeah. Safe base is a precondition for healthy attachment style. Mm -hmm. When the self base is absent or when it is deficient or when the self base creates fear, mm -hmm. Um, then we have insecure attachment styles, such as avoidant, dismissive, avoidant, fearful, and so on and so forth. So this is the clinical term. Now, I think for, the, for a parent to be a safe base, mm -hmm. she needs to have been properly parented. Yeah. And she needs to have internalized her parents, mm -hmm. so th her good parents, so that she can parent herself. Mm -hmm. I think the condition for proper parenting is self-parenting. Anyone who cannot self-parent can never be a good parent. End of story. Never mind how many books he reads and how much money he pays you or me. <laughs> no yeah. way to be yeah. a good parent if you're not a good parent to yourself. Yeah. yeah. Self-love in, in a good sense is critical in, yeah. this, in this. So yeah. there were many scholars who described bad parents dysfunctional parents. So I mentioned one type of such parent, that there's a parent that idolizes, instrumentalizes, objectifies, parentifies. Mm -hmm. And Dre Green in 1978 described another type of parent, the dead mother he called her. That's a mother. The focus was, is always on a mother because up to age two, the mother is critical. Mm -hmm. uh, after age two, the father becomes equally important. But up to age two, the mother is absolutely by far much more critical than the father. Mm -hmm. So Dead mother is a mother who is absent, emotionally or physically, or both unavailable, mm -hmm. cold, detached. Mm -hmm. So this is a dead mother, another type of bad parent. Mm -hmm. There's a third type of bad parent that's a classically abusive bad parent, like my mother who tried to kill me and tortured me physically for 16 years. That's a seriously bad parent. Mm -hmm. um, it's a horror movie. Mm -hmm. So that's another type. But I think the most pernicious type of bad parenting are the parents who, who almost make it, mm -hmm. almost make it. Because if a parent is like my mother, who would break my skull regularly and try to kill me and torture me physically, something like six to eight hours a day, every day for 16 years, yeah. that's actually easier on the child. Yeah. It's easier on the child. And it's easier in the environment because it's easy to discern. It's, it's a clear-cut case. You see it coming, you know. What do you do with a mother or a father who are almost, almost good parents? Mm -hmm. uh, from the outside, they look perfect. Mm -hmm. Even the child has his doubts. Mm -hmm. You know, child says, they're, they're good parents. I mean, why am I reacting like this? Why am I feeling bad? Why am I feeling uncomfortable? What's wrong with me? Yeah. What's wrong with me? Yeah. I think this is the most pernicious type of parenting. Yeah. And regrettably, I would say that in Western civilization, mm -hmm. current day Western civilization, mm -hmm. owing to numerous factors we're not going to right now, you would be hard pressed to find a good parent. And the majority of so-called good parents mm -hmm. are almost good parents. Yeah. This pernicious kind, uh, under the radar, covert mm -hmm. parents, if you wish. Mm -hmm. That, yeah. that's the that's the real yeah, yeah. I, I think that that's 100 percent true because it's for me it's anything that gets you to question your own personal truth so i think that we have the innate ability to understand how to navigate different things so touching on 
you know, being able to develop, you had an amazing training ground. I think of everything as a training ground. So, okay, cool. What am I going to learn? What tool am I going to sharpen? How am I going to get through this? Am I in survival mode? How do I get out of survival mode? And how do I get into a place of peace? And I think when you approach life from that oversimplified perspective, then it allows you to build up that resilience or that, you know, that grit or that, you know, ability to just like accept things for what they are, radical truth, and then be able to navigate through it. And I think a lot of times, whether it's the parent or society, that we are constantly taught to betray ourselves. So with your example, it could be massive gaslighting. So you have your reality that's happening behind closed doors, and then you have the reality that's in the public. So the coverts, right? And so that creates the disharmony and gaslighting by definition is just getting you to question your own truth. So if, if you question your own truth, it stunts your ability to kind of move forward because it doesn't have that radical truth aspect to it, right? And so whether or not you agree with the radical truth, it's accepting this is what it is, and then how do I extract whatever I need to from a survival mode perspective, victim perspective, to become a survivor? And, and I think that isn't a journey, the, the survivor journey isn't something, the victim journey is a massive thing that people are talking about. Survivor journey is not something that's been coined in popularity yet. So I think that a lot of times it's, it's being able to go through that. It, it's, you know, I think that you're a very well balanced, uh, uh, mentally astute and uh, emotionally regulated person. Your self awareness and efficacy and, and everything I, I think is is very um, substantial, very, very high. And considering what you came from, I think is even more of a brush it off your shoulders, another accolade that you can put on the on the wall type of situation. That unfortunately, people aren't always able to say the same thing because people are stuck in that victim mindset. And so that victim mindset prevents them from being able to go through. And, and I see that all the time with myself because people will, will say, you know, Jess, when are you gonna stop talking about domestic violence? When are you gonna stop talking about whatever? Why are you still in that victim mindset? And I said, I'm not. I can have a conversation about it and I can have radical truth because I've accepted it. If I was a victim, I wouldn't still be achieving what I'm achieving, but I'm talking about it to raise awareness and to also say, if I can do it, so can you. And so I think that that in itself is something that a lot of people, they don't, and I'm just thinking out loud, you know, responding to, to what you said. I think that that is a very important and powerful thing in context of parenting, because it's, you know, how do you use that voice? How do you go around that toxic masculinity? How do you, you know, share the, the sentiments that are in your heart to increase from that 1% up to the 40% for, you know, the addiction or whatever, the coping mechanisms. I, I rather than say addiction, I would like to say coping mechanisms. <laughs> and I think that that is a, a construct that is getting us to fail, not just at a nuclear level with our family, but also from a, reinforced by society. So you can oversimplify saying society is gaslighting us because we're just, this is the reality that we know. This is the reality that our parents are saying that's not true. And then when we go to try to evaluate from an academic rational perspective, we're just like, well, pff, heck, I think I'm actually crazy. There's something wrong with me because <laughs> this is what I feel. This is what I'm experiencing. And this is what they're telling me. <laughs> true, yeah. So I think that a lot of times we're just maybe, maybe I'm jaded and in, in thinking of this in the Western context, but I think that the Western world is setting a lot of people up to fail. So reality always sucked. Reality was always bad. Mm -hmm. But in the past, we had numerous support networks. Mm -hmm. Institutions were intact. Mm -hmm. Families, communities, villages, your own social stratum, your professional guild. You belong to a professional guild. You belong to a club. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever the case may be, you had multiple backups. Yeah. You, you, reality was always horrible, too horrible to contemplate. We always, we, we always try to evade and, and escape reality. Escapism is, is not a new pursuit, mm -hmm. but we always knew that someone has our backs. Yeah. And today, what happens is reality sucks like never before, to be honest. Uh, I think that is the worst period in human history. And history is my hobby. And I can, I think personally, it's the worst case in human history, uh, worst period. It exceeds, by now it exceeds the 14th century, which was really, really a period in all to live in. Yeah. 
yeah. you know? And so reality is the worst that it's ever been. We're trying to escape. And the only means of escape are manufactured plastic spectacles. Yeah. Spectacles provided by the media, by show business, by politics, by social media, by everything is a simulacrum. Everything is a substitute. Everything is a cheap plastic knockoff. Everything is counterfeit. Yeah. But there is need for these things because we don't have the real things anymore. We have dispensed with them. We have dispensed with the family. We're, you know, I am not a fan of Jordan Peterson to use um, a British understatement. Mm -hmm. I have my reservations regarding this man and his conduct, or shall I say misconduct. However, a part of his message, if you take aside, a part, take aside the misogyny and the, all the rest, a part of his message is very true. Mm -hmm. We have discarded everything in a hurry mm -hmm. and we had not created any viable substitutes because, because, of this misperception of the individual. Mm -hmm. You are individual, you are divided, you are, you are, so you don't need anyone. You are self-sufficient, you are world unto yourself. Mm -hmm. There is a giant inside you just waiting to wake up if you pay Tony Robbins enough money. You know, it's, we have split, we've atomized, we've split ourselves, broken ourselves to pieces. Mm -hmm. And now we're all alone mm -hmm. and there is no way to weave the fabric back. Yeah. We are trying desperately to create ersatz fake institutions. Yeah. So we have social media, which is the most asocial thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. We have Facebook friends. And, and, and by now, for example, marriage is an extinct institution. Mm -hmm. now, families, child rearing, child bearing, I mean, they're all on massive decline. Mm -hmm. And nothing nothing and so we we have nowhere to turn to but ourselves yeah. nowhere to turn to but ourselves and when we turn to ourselves it's by definition a pathology yeah. if you become your only source of sustenance succor uh, and so on that's a pathology that really is a pathology that's not even something healthy even our brains as a as a hardware mm -hmm. our brains are constructed to reach out we call it senses we have senses our brains are not are not solipsistic. They're not inward looking. Our brains are outward looking. Mm -hmm. And when we look out, what do we see? Nothingness. There's mm -hmm. nothing there. There's nobody there. Mm -hmm. We all objectify each other. So there's nobody there. Yeah. I, may, I may approach a woman because I want to have sex. She may approach me because she wants to have money. We may both approach someone because he's a politician can give us access. We, we objectify everyone. Mm -hmm. And nothing, I don't know if it's reversible. I don't know. I mentioned Peterson. Peterson hopes and thinks it is in his own dysfunctional way. He hopes and thinks it is. I have my grave doubts if it is, my grave doubts. We are all, you know, it's been predicted. There was a guy called uh, Durkheim, Emil Durkheim, about a hundred and something years ago. And he wrote a book called On Suicide. And then he wrote another book and he said, in the future, societies are gonna be anomic. In other words, all, all standards, all norms of behavior, everything will collapse. And he said, that's gonna to lead to isolated people in cubicles and a wave of suicide, real or psychological suicide, mm -hmm. like suspension, suspension of the self. Mm -hmm. What is binge, binge watching Netflix? What is workaholism? Numbing. What is drug Numbing. addiction? What Numbing. is alcoholism? Numbing. 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 Women. It's suicide. It's psychological suicide. It's not being. It's unbeing. We have perfected the arts of unbeing. It's the first civilization that is perfecting all possible ways and technologies to unbe. Mm -hmm. And where you are, where you're allowed to be, it's based on competition and so, so again you are not it's because I keep repeating real being is contextual mm -hmm. there's no real being as individual that is the primordial sin of psychology primordial sin yeah absolutely I mean I think that you know like even <laughs> we're called human beings we're not called human doings 
And so I think, you know, just oversimplified my, you know, addiction or my coping mechanism was by achieving, right? So that, that's on how I processed, that's on how I stayed out of my body because I didn't want to deal with certain things for a very long time. And then when I took a step back and realized my own dysfunction, then I was able to say, okay, is this actually a tool that I enjoy or is this a coping mechanism because I'm avoiding something? And asking myself these questions and being able to deep dive and then do my own work was so incredibly transformative and, and powerful for me to become a human being. So now I have the choice where I can be in you know, grind mode and achieve mode, but then I can also have multiple hours of just simply being. And I can, since I moved into my new apartment, I have yet to miss a sunset. So I will stand right. in the middle of my, my kitchen. Yes, I'll sit in the middle of my kitchen and I'll just look out and watch the, the, the sunset, which is amazing because I have classes two nights a week and some of my students, I call them warriors, they'll laugh at me because rather than stare at the computer screen, you know, checking their form and everything, I'm gazing up and I'm like, it's so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think it's, it's a balance of being able to, you know, do and also be, which I think a lot of times referencing, you know, when you're talking about binging and, you know, Netflixing or any of that, that is a, a constant state of avoiding wanting to, to, to deal with something or to um, sit with something. And society has taught us that there's good and bad emotions. I don't believe that there's good and bad emotions. I believe that emotions are messages from the soul to tell us whether or not we're doing something that is good for us or something that's bad for us, something that's healthy versus unhealthy. So if we're, you know, um, sitting, maybe, maybe to watch something funny is what we need in that exact moment. To make it a habit, that's when it shifts from a tool into a coping mechanism. Why are we doing this on a regular basis? Why are we watching rather than one or two episodes for a laugh to get us out of that moment of overwhelm into the actual moment? Why are we doing it for 15 hours? I mean, there, there's, watching, there's, watching there's a single a Watching a single episode is an internal locus of control. It means mm -hmm. you control it. Watch, binge watching is an external locus of control. Agreed. You're allowing the, the watching to control you. I have nine, I have a client in seven minutes, Jessica. Thank you so much for your it's time. It's been a huge I... pleasure to talk to you, really. <laughs> I enjoyed every minute. I apologize if I hogged the conversation or monopolized it, as is my habit. I tried no, not it, to, it, I really tried. I, I, it was a beautiful it, dance. It was a beautiful dance. I am okay. just, I would just like to say thank you once again. You have been a, a giant source of inspiration and motivation and um, ability for me to check myself at, at various points. And so I just want to say thank you so much. This is a very enjoyable way to start. It's been my, a, true, my a true pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm going to say goodbye now. Thank you. Bye.